spectacles, testicles, brandy, cigars. You're all popes. You're all absolutely infallible. I have the authority to appoint anybody a Discordian Pope because I'm a Discordian Pope. The first rule after you become a Discordian Pope is to excommunicate every Discordian Pope you meet. This is based on the basic Discordian principle, we Discordians must stick apart. <laughs> Discordians don't have dogmas, uh, which are absolute beliefs. We have catmas, which are relative meta-beliefs. <laughs> The central discordian katma is, as I said before, uh, any affirmation is true in some sense, false in some sense, meaningless in some sense, true and false in some sense, true and meaningless in some sense, false and meaningless in some sense, and true and false and meaningless in some sense. And if you repeat this 666 times, you will achieve supreme enlightenment in some, <laughs> in some sense. Robert Anton Wilson was a polymath genius and philosopher, occultist, author, and comedian. In this video, we are going to look at an obscure article written by Wilson for Gnosis Magazine entitled Synchronicity, Isomorphism, and the Implicate Order. I tried to get some idea of what might be the process which was implied by the mathematics of the quantum theory. And this process is what I call enfoldment, that the mathematics itself suggests a movement in which everything in which any particular element of space ha may have a field which unfolds into the whole and, and, and the whole folds and enfolds into it. Right? So you have this movement and uh, I call this the implicate or enfolded order which unfolds into the explicate order where everything is separate. Now the implicate order, everything is internally related to everything. Everything contains everything, right? So everybody has ex many experiences of this implicate order. The most obvious one is ordinary consciousness, where consciousness enfolds everything that you know or see, right? <laughs> and so you're not acting me mechanistically in the sense of being pushed and pulled by objects in the surroundings, <laughs> but rather according to your consciousness of them, you act. <laughs> and so the consciousness is really our most immediate uh, experience of, of this implicate order. And you may think of nets of consciousness that are finer and finer, or we may think of capturing finer and finer aspects of the implicate order. Right? I think there's an, an intelligence that's, uh, Im that's in implicit there, you see, to say uh, that uh, a kind of intelligence <laughs> unfolds. Right? The source of intelligence is not necessarily in the brain, you see, uh, the ultimate source, all the, but uh, much more uh, enfolded into the whole. Right? Now, uh, the question what do you want to call it God, that depends on what you mean by the word, you see, because uh, uh, taking it as a personal God might restrict it in some way. The article draws on ideas related to symmetry from mathematics and geometry while also offering some history and anecdotes from the life of Carl Gustav Jung. I personally suspect that synchronicity is facilitated by the existence of a higher order of symmetry that extends from our internal to our external experiences, and these experiences are precipitated when we build a bridge between the conscious and subconscious mind, a process Jung called individuation. The symmetry is alluded to by the popular glyph of synchronistic experiences 1111. This article offers solid support for this theory in more technical depth than I could have offered. The symmetries of the universe. There are many complex laws that seemingly govern our universe. Conservation of energy, of momentum, general relativity, the standard model of particles. Yet all this complexity emerges from a deeper, purer concept, of which all these laws are only consequences. Symmetry. In mathematics, a symmetry is a transformation which leaves an object unchanged. Studying the symmetries of the universe allows us to understand in a deep way the origin of the laws which govern it. It is because the universe has symmetries that the objects it contains, in order to respect these symmetries, obey physical laws. Be it conservation of energy or momentum, objects obey these laws only to respect underlying symmetries, intrinsic to the universe. 
During the course of the reading, when we encounter interesting subjects such as Finnegan's Wake, a nearly impossible work where James Joyce used polyglot and portmanteau words to create a spiraling metaphysical masterpiece in holographic prose, we will zoom in to examine these supporting subjects in depth. Before we begin, though, we are demonetized, so please like, share, and subscribe, and consider becoming a patron. Your contribution allows us to continue providing revolutionary, world-changing content. Synchronicity, Isomorphism, and the Implicate Order, Notes on Jung and Quantum Mechanics by Robert Anton Wilson. No concept in Jungian psychology creates more controversy than the idea of synchronicity. To mention the subject at all is to be immediately classified as loony by such groups as the Committee for Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, whose very synchronistic acronym, PSYCHOP, seems a bit self-defeating. Yet, paradoxically, no other Jungian theory has aroused more enthusiasm among artists, writers, mystics, and strangely, quantum physicists. If there is any truth in the synchronicity model, which could be defined as psychologically induced space-time relativity, it explains perhaps even more than Jung himself realized. If there's no truth in it, it must count as the most plausible error of the 20th century. Let us examine some examples of alleged synchronicity and of seemingly related phenomena and gradually draw our own conclusions. Dune's Precognition. In 1902, the aeronautical engineer J.W. Dune had a vivid nightmare in which he saw a French speaking island and in dream logic knew that a city there was about to be destroyed by a volcanic eruption. The nightmare elements were the usual hurrying, getting lost, etc., in an attempt to warn the people. Dune in the dream knew that 4,000 would be killed. Two days later, a volcano blew in French-speaking Martinique, and 40,000 were killed. I too had an experience where I had a vision of a massive flood in the desert and I was living in southwestern uh, Colorado and so I packed up all my stuff into the car and got my girlfriend and some fishing poles and drove up into the peaks to wait out the flood. The rain however turned out to be very moderate and I went home feeling a bit silly. The next morning, however, on my way to work, I stopped into the gas station and discovered that a flood in Pakistan had indeed killed thousands and thousands of people. The fundamentalist materialist, of course, says sheer coincidence, but some of us are haunted by the omnipresence of such coincidences in human life and would dearly love to have a scientific explanation for them rather than a mere pejorative label to dismiss them. What is interesting to me is that many parapsychologists would happily classify Dune's dream as precognition although the fundamentalist materialists are hardly grateful to him for it. Jung's theory of synchronicity provides a less spooky and more scientific interpretation than the precognition theory. Furthermore, as we shall see, Jung's intuition that synchronicity somehow connects with quantum mechanics has more supporting evidence now than when he first uttered it. It is also suggestive that Dune dreamed of 4,000 casualties and the news story two days later provided 40,000. This does tend to remind one of transmission errors in other communication channels. The Haggard Effect A World War I story from the Daily Mail of London. One battery of British soldiers observed a repeating pattern. Every time they received a book by H. Ryder Haggard, they would shortly receive an SOS. Eventually, they all became so convinced that this coincidence was repeating that they requested no more books by Haggard to be sent to them. The number of SOSs then declined. It seems odd that this happened to military men, except for Kipling. Haggard was the ablest defender of militarism in British literature. I also note that Haggard wrote She, which many consider the classic portrait of a Jungian anima, or female archetype, and Jung connected synchronicities with archetypes. The Spy Who Came Through the Floor When Norlin Mailer began work on his novel, Barbary Shore, there was no Russian spy in it. As Mailer worked, a Russian spy entered the cast and gradually became the dominant character. After the book was published, the FBI came around and arrested the man living in the apartment below Mailer. He was Colonel Boris Abel, named the top Russian spy in the U.S. at that time. Once again, I think of the relative conservatism of the synchronicity model. Some occultists would cheerfully claim that psychic emanations from Colonel Abel were rising through the floor and invading Mailer's typewriter or brain. 
I also think the fundamentalist materialist chant or banishing ritual, coincidence, 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 sounds increasingly like an attempt to evade the problem raised by such data rather than to deal with it. A Bridge in Time. When Hart Crane was living in Brooklyn Heights, he wrote his epic poem, The Bridge, in which the building of the Brooklyn Bridge, the longest suspension bridge ever attempted until its time, is a symbol of human aspiration and hope. Only a year later did Crane discover that the address at which he lived while writing the poem was where Washington Rubling, the crippled chief engineer on the bridge, had lived nearly 50 years earlier. Some will regard this as haunting or psychic residue. Synchronicity again Sorry. seems like a less radical notion than its occult rivals. Black and white. In Switzerland in 1915, James Joyce met a man named Schwartz, black, who introduced him to a man named Weiss, which means white. Since Joyce was as fluent in German as in English, this coincidence amused and intrigued him. But it was through Weiss that Joyce met Jung himself. Joyce later went on to build a black and white symbolism in Finnegan's Wake. This is the kind of thing that drives Psychop to froth at the mouth. Joyce, as we all know, had ruined his mind by reading too much hermetic philosophy, and it was absurd of him to find meaning in a coincidence of names. Mind-like structures. Leibniz invented the binary number system in the early 1700s. As he himself was the first to discover in 1713, this code is entirely isomorphic. Do you see these two friendship networks between four people? Here are our friends A, B, C, D. And there, here again, we, are, we have four other friends W, X, Y, Z. As you can see, these four are different people, those four are different people. But if I were to exclude the people here, and only look at these two graphs. Are they structurally the same? Doesn't look like it. Look at it now. Don't you think it is the same structurally? It is indeed. So, such graphs are called isomorphic graph. By iso we mean same. By morphic we mean same yet different similar in structure to the I Ching, a Chinese work so old that it has been called the oldest book in the world. The 64 hexagrams of the Qing are different isomorphs of the first 64 numbers, 0 to 63 in binary. More recently, Martin Schoenberger has demonstrated that both the Qing and binary are isomorphic to the 64 codons of the genetic code. Codons is three letters forms a codon. And these three-letter codons can combine in all kinds of different ways. So here's the DNA formed by pyrimidines and purines. Just like the male and the female part of the I Ching, these form the four basic bases. And that's the four basic bases of the hexagrams. And that these combinations form the trigrams, which is the RNA, and the trigrams stacked together form the 64 codons of DNA. DNA has 64 codons. The progression is exactly mirrored in the I Ching. This is more provocative than it appears at first glance. Modern computers operate on Leibniz's binary code and materialists claim these machines can think or will soon think. But mystics say this is impossible because the machines lack souls. Yet the I Ching operates on the same code, and here the positions are reversed. Materialists deny that the Qing thinks, gives meaningful answers. But mystics claim it does think. The human brain operates on a similar binary system, which may account for the occasional impression that people think, or can think at times. The DNA code is isomorphic to both binary and the Qing, a fact that throws an entirely new light on the vexed question, is there a mind or something like a mind behind evolution? It appears there is something at least as mind-like as the I Ching or a computer. The Haunted Bookcase. One day in 1909, Freud and Jung were having an argument about parapsychology. As tempers flared, there suddenly came an explosive bang from the bookcase. Jung said that was an example of a catalytic phenomenon. Freud said, Bosch. Suddenly seized with intuitive certainty, Jung announced 
that to prove he was right, there would be a second explosive crash from the bookcase. There was. A wobble in time. Robert Harvey, an English psychologist, was reading Jung's account of the above incident to a friend. When he came to the second explosive boom, a lamp in his room fell over for no apparent cause. Poltergeists, anyone? The explosions continue. After Arthur Kessler described Freud's exploding bookcase and the roots of coincidence, he received a letter from a woman named Margaret Green. She reported reading Kessler's account of the incident while on a train. As she read, the window beside her burst as if hit by a rock. Instead of an itinerant poltergeist, I prefer to attribute this to mischievous boy standing near the railroad tracks, as the fundamentalist materialist would. Nonetheless, I think it is a damned peculiar coincidence that the hypothetical boy threw the conjectural rock at exactly that instant. Amusingly, I was discussing the whole chain of explosions with my wife in a San Francisco restaurant in 1981. I commented that I had written and spoken about this psychic chain reaction many times without triggering anything that went bump in the night. As I said that, my water glass inexplicably spilled. A waiter rushed over to mop up the tablecloth and knocked over my wife's water. Best not to think about all that, probably. What is going on here? In the familiar oriental metaphor, each individual mind is an aspect of our manifestation of the Alaya Vijnana, the treasury unconscious, as expounded by Lama Govinda, as all the facets of a diamond are aspects of the one stone. This thought has proven easy to memorize and repeat, just go to any New Age convention, but it is rather hard to grasp fully. Let's see if we can, as the Chinese say, draw our chairs closer to the fire and endeavor to understand what we are talking about. Correlation without connection. Everything in physics, from Newton to Einstein, can be explained in terms of the familiar billiard ball model. That is, if A is correlated with B, then B and A must have collided with each other, or with some hidden C which collided with both, like the billiard balls on the pool table. Since the 1920s, there has been a dawning suspicion that quantum mechanics does not demand such mechanical or causal connections to produce correlation. In the 1960s, Dr. John S. Bell of the CERN Nuclear Research Center in Switzerland published an elegant mathematical proof that quantum mechanics does indeed indicate that correlations exist without connections. Such a-causal correlations are called non-local effects, a term first introduced by Dr. David Bohm. This perfect illustration of a non-local correlation predicted by Bell and experimentally verified five times now occurs when photons are emitted from a mercury atom. Photon counters are set far enough apart that the time for light to travel between them is 20 nanoseconds. They are then activated by switches which act in 10 nanoseconds. Since light cannot travel from one photon counter to the other in the time of the measurement, and nothing known to physics can travel faster than light, there can be no mechanical or causal connection between the two photons when measured. Nonetheless, the photons remain mathematically correlated and this effect persists whatever property of the photons is being measured. It is as if each photon knows what the other is doing. These days we call this entanglement. A parallel on the microscopic level was given to me by American physicist Dr. Nick Herbert. Imagine a man in Moscow and a man in Washington, and imagine that we have discovered they only have two pairs of socks. If they behaved as photons do in Bell's theorem and in experiments, the man in Moscow would only wear black socks when the man in Washington was wearing white socks. But even more astounding, if we somehow got the black socks off the man in Moscow and replaced them with white socks, the man in Washington would immediately, before any news bulletin at the speed of light or less could reach him, remove his white socks and replace them with black socks. It is as if he knew telepathically what was happening to his partner in Moscow. It bears an uncanny resemblance to Jungian synchronicity, doesn't it? In a recent interview, Dr. David Bohm, the man who coined the word non-locality, commented on the implications of the latest experimental verification of Bell's theorem. It may mean that everything in the universe is in a kind of total rapport, so that whatever happens is related to everything else. Or it may mean that there is some kind of information that can travel faster than the speed of light, or it may mean that our concepts of space and time have to be modified in some way that we don't now understand. The first of Bohm's three alternatives sounds remarkably like Jung's concept of synchronicity. It also sounds like the monism of the Upanishads, Spinoza, etc. 
It also seems a clear and coherent formulation of what Joyce was getting at in Finnegan's Wake, where he links everything in Dublin with everything else in the space-time continuum. The second Bohmian alternative, Information Faster Than Light, is called Information Without Transportation by San Francisco physicist Dr. Jack Safardi, who is its lone proponent in the scientific community at this time. It implies the possibility of sending messages to one's ancestors with all the sci-fi paradoxes associated with that concept. Yet at least these ghostly information units would provide a mechanism to explain not only synchronicity, but those wild phenomena called precognition, ESP, clairvoyance, and memories of past lives. In Illuminostics theoretical framework, we call this transtemporal isomorphs. Bohm's third alternative, a redefinition of space and time to include non-local correlations, seems to lead us back to Oriental ontologies and Jungian synchronicity. Or else it leads us to some destination we can't even imagine now. Just how serious this redefinition might be is indicated by Dr. John Archibald Wheeler, who has pointed out that bell-type correlations are non-local in time as well as in space, a fact overtly expressed in Bell's math, but one most physicists have we not gotten around to digesting yet. According to Wheeler, one must consider that by non-local correlation, every experiment we perform on the subatomic level is affecting the Big Bang and thus recreating the universe in which we live. This speculation of Wheeler's, nutty as it may sound, at least explains the anthropic principle, the odd fact that we live in a universe which seems designed for human beings. Theists, of course, have always accepted design and usually claim to know the designer by name. Most scientists claim apparent design is merely accident, as apparent synchronicity to them is merely coincidence. But the anthropic principle insists the design is there, with or without a centralized designer. According to Wheeler, we are the designers. Bohm actually has a fourth alternative, which to me at least, makes more sense than any of the above. Unfortunately, it is rather recondite and dense, and this model, which Bohm has been constructing and improving since the early 1950s, the universe has both an explicate and an implicate order. The explicate or unfolded order is what we normally see, the world of seemingly solid and separate objects in space-time. The implicate or unfolded order is not perceptible, but can be deduced from the data of modern quantum mechanics. It is the same within every seemingly separate part of the ep explicate order. Well, I warned you it would be dense. The implicate order could explain what I consider to be one of the most remarkable coincidences or synchronicities in the known universe, which is the latitude of the Great Pyramid of Giza, which is exactly the speed of light. Of course, the ancient Egyptians did not use the same latitude system, nor did they measure speed in miles per hour. However, this coincidence is compounded by the fact that the great mysteries that were observed in the Great Pyramids were entirely focused on light. This is also highly suggestive of the idea that the universe is somehow made of consciousness, and that this higher order of symmetry has as its basis a relationship to that fact. The Bohm model is often compared to a hologram. In a hologram, the information of every part contains the information of the whole, as you must have heard by now. You can hack off a piece of a hologram and it will contain the same information as the whole you hacked it off of. Well, the universe is like that too, according to Bohm. In other words, one day in Dublin, 
may contain the information of the whole human odyssey, as Joyce tried to demonstrate in Finnegan's Wake. Finnegan's Wake has been called the most intricate artistic creation in human history. It is constructed in portmanteau and polyglot words, so that when read aloud, there is phonetically an English-sounding word, but each syllable may have a different meaning in any of the 72 languages that Joyce drew upon to create the book. Each syllable of a word may have different meanings in different languages. So, say, san means without in Latin, but has a totally different meaning in Quechua. And so, every syllable may have many different interpretations in different languages, and all of these variations can be strung together to extract entire paragraphs from a single sentence, giving the prose a holographic nature. To add to this language of concrete symbolism, the book is littered with historical, Kabbalistic, Masonic, and other references that add layers of meaning to the work. Double meanings abound. Even the title Finnegan is a reference to the plight of the main character, Finn again, who has either awoken from the dead, or a nap, or a drunken stupor, or has been reincarnated, or may even be symbolic of the changing of the gods of the new Aeon. The book begins and ends in the middle of the same word, creating a circular plot that implies the Ouroboros, the serpent with his tail in his mouth, and together with the four layers of subplots, makes four concentric circles, an important occult symbol representing the forces of the universe, from the four elements to the four fundamental forces of physics to the four directions, and so on. This book is not read so much as it is deciphered, almost exclusively by intellectuals, using entire skeleton key books written by giants of the intellect, such as the Harvard mythologist Joseph Campbell, to assist them over their entire lifetime as they chew away at the book. Here is an example of a thunder word, variations of which punctuate the book throughout the story. And that's your first thunder word. Happy practicing. The peculiarities of Joyce's style result from his attempts to convey this vision by creating holographic prose. Blake asserted he could see infinity as a grain of sand, but Joyce tried to show it to us. Got it? Bloom in Ulysses is not the reincarnation of Odysseus and Hamlet's father. He is merely, like them, another local manifestation of one non-local hidden variable in the implicate order. Our consciousness, like that of Joyce's creatures, is not an area within our brains, but a network of connections through space and time. An ancient Chinese sage or sages found the same binary system as Leibniz because that system is non-local, in our genetic code for instance. Telepathy is not information traveling from one head to another, and precognition is not information traveling backwards in time. Rather, the same non-local information is present in every part of our holographic universe. Bohm has not drawn these conclusions this boldly, but another physicist has, Dr. Edwin Harris Walker, has began expounding this theory, non-locality of mind as well as of matter since the early 1970s. I have been mulling this over since Bell and Bohm first came to my attention in the early 1970s, and it seems to me that in any non-local theory, the notion that I am in my brain is as naive as the notion that Johnny Carson is in my TV set. After all, how can Johnny Carson be in millions of TV sets simultaneously? How can I be in two places at once when really I'm nowhere at all, as the Firesign Theater once asked? Biolocation is as common in parapsychological data as our telepathy, precognition, synchronicity, and the especially provocative out-of-body experience, all of which make perfect sense if we simply assume that the implicate order of the universe remains non-local, even while the unfolded explicate order seems divided into separate and localized persons and things. Isomorphism and synchronicity are both aspects of the basic non-locality of information. Maybe we all needed to get working at computers before any of us, including the physicists, could understand such a notion. Jung tried to explain synchronicity as a connection at right angles to the near causality. As many critics have pointed out, that is an excellent metaphor, but hardly a precise scientific theory. Yet Jung was on the right track. He kept insisting that somehow, somewhere in quantum theory, the actual mechanism of synchronicity would be found and defined. In the late 1980s, it begins to look as if we have started to understand it. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. I hope you found this thought-provoking. 
please hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon where you can join our secret streams. And don't forget to hit the like button, share, subscribe. Thanks for watching. Your son.